Meet the Experts is brought to you by Moffitt's Patient Library and Welcome Center. To view a full list of live upcoming sessions, please visit moffitt.org slash meet the experts or call 813-745-1690. Welcome to our Meet the Experts on Low Inflammatory Diet for Overall Health. Let me introduce to you um, today our speaker, Ms. Diana Riccardi, who is a registered dietitian nutritionist at Moffitt McKinley Outpatient Center. As a team member, she has spent 22 years at Moffitt specializing in oncology nutrition, providing counseling on nutrition and health promotion strategies during and after cancer treatment. Ms. Riccardi believes that health is one of the most valuable assets a person can have and proper nutrition, exercise and stress management is of utmost importance for disease prevention and treatment. The content is not intended to be medical advice and the viewers should consult their physicians should they have any questions. Viewers should not rely on information contained in this presentation for immediate or urgent medical needs. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your physician, go to the nearest emergency department or call 911 immediately. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking care because of information contained in this presentation. Now, without any more delays, here is Ms. Diane. Well, thank you for having me today and for tuning in with us. Um, there's been a lot of research on low inflammatory foods over the years. So here we see the cover of Time Magazine calling inflammation the secret killer linked to heart attacks, cancer, and Alzheimer's and other diseases. You may be surprised to learn that this concept has been known for over 17 years. This Time Magazine was published in February of 2004. It's important to know that inflammation in itself is our body's way of healing and it is a natural function of our immune system designed to keep us healthy. Classic signs of inflammation include heat, redness, swelling, pain, and loss of function. Now, acute inflammation is very good in that it promotes healing and it prevents infection. This is the way our immune system gets nutrients, immune cells like our white blood cells and cytokines to an area that is injured. So we can see those classic signs of inflammation here. We can see the swelling, the redness. Uh, there's also loss of function, which basically allows the wound to heal. After an injury, our body calls this like cellular 911. And then our immune system is alerted to battle. It runs in, it fixes the problem, and then it dissipates. Where problems occur, however, is when the inflammatory response does not shut off. So it fails to eliminate the problem and it goes from being temporary and localized that we just saw and protected to now being chronic and harmful. So this inflammation is usually more subtle and it can go on inside the body without producing all of those classic symptoms that we just saw. So chronic inflammation is associated with chronic disease such as cancer, as we saw in the Time Magazine article. For example, we've known for a long time the link between inflammation and arthritis, but inflammation of our endothelial cells and our arteries can lead to heart disease. And inflammation can also promote DNA damage, which then can lead to cancer. Now, while some factors associated with inflammation can't be changed, there are many things we can do to reduce chronic inflammation in our body. So staying active and maintaining a healthy body weight can help reduce C-reactive protein levels, especially for those of us carrying kind of extra pounds around the midsection. So for example, if our waist circumference is greater than 35 inches for women or 40 inches in men, then our excess body weight is being stored as visceral fat, fat around the organs, which is very harmful as itself can secrete hormones like estrogen and inflammatory markers. In fact, obesity is often referred to as a low-grade inflammatory disease in itself. 
Also poor sleep quality or quantity also leads to inflammation as does daily or high or prolonged stress. Now, while many of the foods that make up the standard American diet promote infl inflammation, and we would recommend you try to minimize or cut these foods out completely. So there are two main types of added sugars in the American diet. So there's sucrose, which is table sugar and high fructose corn syrup. So for example, 40 grams of fructose, the amount in one can of soda can cause a spike in inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein in just 30 minutes. Furthermore, that C-reactive protein can remain high for over three hours. Now, sucrose isn't much better as high fructose corn syrup, as it can also lead to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. When we compare that to natural sugars like fructose in fruit or the lactose milk sugar, those particular natural sugars have not been linked to inflammation. So anything is, and what we want to avoid is anything highly processed. So something overly greasy or super sweet isn't going to be a good choice. Like those refined carbohydrates, white bread, white breads, pastries. Also processed meats like bacon can increase inflammation in the gut and encourage growth of harmful bacteria. Then we have things that are saturated fats found in red meat and cheese. And then trans fats found in like French fries and microwave popcorn and coffee creamers and packaged cookies. Trans fat, which is also located on seen on the nutrition label, is an artificial fat made by adding hydrogen atoms to unsaturated fats. So microwave popcorn, fried foods, packaged cookies and cakes, they're all going to have trans fat. And trans fat is probably the unhealthiest fat that we can eat. So look at your food ingredient list. If you see the ingredient partially hydrogenated fats, then you know there's gonna be some trans fat in the food. If you have food sensitivities now, say you're sensitive to gluten or dairy, or you have a lactose intolerance, um, you, that particular food might be inflammatory for you because you have a food sensitivity. And then of course, alcohol. Alcohol may develop leaky gut syndrome. Bacterial toxins can move in and out of the colon and into the bloodstream. So alcohol is considered inflammatory. Now, if you want to reduce inflammation, there are foods that can help. So instead of listing those foods, I chose to put them into food groups to make it easier to put into practice. So to reduce inflammation, the produce section is a great place to start. And here's a, a picture of when I visited the famous Pike Place Market in Seattle that has lots of produce to pick from. When choosing fruits, remember the more colorful, the better. So variety is the key. So when, we're, when we say eat the rainbow, we mean try to get fruits that are in all different colors. So free radicals are produced by and result in inflammation. So anything that's in a fruit that's considered an antioxidant can neutralize those free radicals in the body and, the, and reduce damage to our cells, that DNA damage that we've spoke about before. So now fruits are also high in fiber. And recent studies shows that a high fiber diet for two weeks can increase the amount of healthy bacteria in our gut where most of our immune system is located. Now, don't forget also, in addition to fruits, they're pretty high in water content. And water um, is another anti-inflammatory or low inflammatory um, part of our diet. Now, berries are probably the highest, but all fruits can lower inflammation. Tart cherries in particular can dilate blood vessels. And a small shot glass of tart cherry juice is being consumed by athletes after a workout to try and dilate the blood vessels so they have less injury, muscle injury. Now, cooking, um, it's important to know, like for example, with our vegetables, try to use as another low inflammatory group of foods. Try to use as little water as possible. Don't overcook them till wilting. Uh, because you're trying to preserve the nutrients that can reduce inflammation in the body. So a little oil can help the body absorb some of those carotenoids, but water keeps things basically more fluid. 
So you see here cruciferous vegetables. They have a compound called sulforaphane, which blocks the inflammatory process. There's been a lot of research done with these types of vegetables and rheumatoid arthritis. Green leafy vegetables high in folate also can reduce inflammation. Bright orange and red vegetables are listed here and the nightshade vegetables. So people are sometimes concerned about nightshade. Um, term, the term was coined since the plants prefer to grow in shady areas or, or they flower at night. Um, because I usually get a lot of questions because Tom Brady, um, well, you know, doesn't consume nightshades because he's trying to follow a low inflammatory diet. But while true for some people, there's really no scientific evidence, according to the Arthritis Foundation, that removing these nightshade vegetables can actually reduce inflammation in the body. And there are a lot of other benefits, like these particular vegetables are all high in vitamin C, which is an antioxidant. Now, what about fermented foods? They are not low inflammatory in themselves, but they support the gut. And if we can support the gut, then we can support our immune system. So how does a healthy microbiome keep inflammation in check? Basically, our gut absorbs nutrients into the bloodstream. If it's healthy, it will just absorb the nutrients, but not much else. The good bacteria will only let good nutrients through. So without these good bacteria, if we don't have them in place, the protective lining in our gut is not as strong and other things can get through the intestinal wall and into the bloodstream and can lead to inflammation. This is called leaky gut where there are gaps or holes where other things can get in. So these fermented foods can help keep the gut healthy and the barrier strong. Healthy fats can also be potent um, inflammation fighters, so they can lower inflammation in the body. You've probably heard a lot about omega-3 fatty acids. Um, omega-3, that when we say omega-3 or omega-9, that is just referring to the location of the last double bond from the omega end of the molecule. So it's really just referring to the chemical structure of the fatty acid. So omega-3 fatty acids and omega-9 fatty acids soothe inflammation in the body. So things like canola oil, olive oil, avocado oil. Um, in fact, olive oil has an ingredient or a chemical called oleocanthal that has properties that are similar to ibuprofen, which is a drug that can reduce inflammation in the body. Now, cold pressed is somewhat preferred over those that are heated. So if you can get cold pressed oils, and then of course, the best source of omega-3 fatty acids is gonna be from your fish. Um, so just if you're concerned about fish and mercury, just can kind of consider the food chain. So albacore tuna is a large predator and it's higher up the end. Uh, so it's going to have more mercury uh, than some of the other fish. But if you don't eat the skin and you eliminate some of the brown fat, you can lower the mercury that's, that's in the food. Or if you limit your fish to twice a week, then we know that you're not getting too much mercury in the body. Turmeric is a very strong spice. So you have to be creative in how you eat it. But it is one of the spices along with ginger and cinnamon and garlic and onion and oregano that can really reduce inflammation in the body. Um, golden milk, for example, uh, you can make golden milk. That's any milk, uh, maybe a plant-based milk with turmeric powder and honey. That can be a way that you can get your turmeric in. You can sprinkle it on savory foods or vegetables or eggs. The absorption of some of these herbs, in particular turmeric, really increases by adding black pepper and some fat. So if you're gonna make a smoothie with using turmeric, add avocado or chia seeds. Ginger, another strong flavored spice, uh, can block prostaglandin production. And in that way, it can reduce inflammation, similar to the ibuprofen, as we said before. So you can use it in a smoothie, some Asian dishes or, or teas. Teas themselves are all um, low inflammatory. So there's matcha, there's green tea, there's black tea. They all come from the same tea plant. Uh, just some are fermented or not fermented. 
Uh, the caffeine content varies between the three of them, but they all reduce inflammation. Now, I frequently get the question, you know, can I take a supplement instead? So supplements are really intended to supplement the diet. So we have to start with a healthy diet and then determine, are there things that we can add to, or are there things that we need? Are there things that we're deficient in? For example, if we're deficient in vitamin D, then that would be a supplement that we would want to take. But always remember that if you're taking a supplement, you're probably taking it in a dose that's going to have a drug-like effect. For example, turmeric comes in 500 milligram capsule doses. If you're getting turmeric in that golden milk tea, you're getting five milligrams. So if you're taking turmeric in the form of a supplement, you're gonna be getting a hundred times the dose. And that's why anytime you're taking a supplement or want to take a supplement, we tell you to make sure you check with your doctor in case there might be any interactions with any other medications you're taking. Now, one diet considered low inflammatory is the Mediterranean diet. And that has really been shown in studies to reduce inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. After just three months, you can reduce these inflammatory markers in your bodies. Um, in the 1960s, the seven country study found that this diet, and they specifically looked at the Mediterranean diet in Southern Italy and Crete to be the healthiest, meaning lower rate of heart disease. And since then, studies have continued to show its support and benefit in reducing chronic diseases. Here's what the diet looks like. It's the food pyramid. So you want to consume the most of what's at the bottom of the food period in the pyramid or makes up the largest amount. So it's an abundance of plant foods. So you can see the fruits and vegetables at the very bottom mean most of the diet would have fresh fruits and vegetables, maybe at every meal. People don't think about adding vegetables at their breakfast, but if you're making an egg and you're going to be putting in spinach, you have an opportunity to put in a lot of vegetables in that egg. Um, olive oil, they use olive oil in the Mediterranean in place of butter. Uh, they consume whole grains, not refined grains. Uh, like they would consume stone ground sourdough bread, maybe four to five times a day. Uh, in the Mediterranean, they consume beans often. Seafood, they consume twice a week. And then some poultry, um, daily yogurt with small amounts of cheeses. They really do not consume sugary drinks. Um, they would have, instead of desserts or sweet desserts, they would have fresh fruit. And they're really, their honey sweet desserts, maybe once a week, uh, with very little intake of red meats. So lamb would be for Easter or special occasions only. Their wine intake, their alcohol intake is primarily wine, but it's moderate intake, and it's usually with a meal. What this diet, Mediterranean diet, is not is processed foods. So they consume in the Mediterranean what's in season. They don't follow fad diets like we do in America. Uh, they don't consume large portions, they consume small portions. Uh, their foods aren't really high in salt. They prefer to use herbs and spices such as garlic and oregano and some of the herbs we talked about that reduce inflammation. So the bottom line, so some of the things we covered today is that I think we showed today that chronic inflammation is unhealthy and it can lead to a wide range of diseases, including cancer. That healthy lifestyle choices can reduce chronic inflammation in the body. So these things, some things about inflammation in the body are within our control. There is not one food that can reduce inflammation alone. So the overall diet is important. So the dietary pattern is important. So for example, not just adding berries to your diet, but to eating more of a Mediterranean diet where you're having fruits and vegetables at every meal. And that supplements alone cannot replace a diet, the low inflammatory diet. So I'd like to thank you very much for attending the presentation today. If you would like more information, please contact the nutrition department at 813-745-3609. Thank you for viewing this session. We offer live Meet the Expert sessions through Zoom. To see a full list of upcoming sessions, please visit moffit.org slash meet the experts or call 813-745-1690.